worship you, God. We love the beauty of your presence, Lord God. We welcome you. Papa, we welcome you into this place. We welcome you, Daddy, in to our midst to be with us, to teach us. Spirit of truth, we welcome you in here, into our hearts and into our minds to speak to us to speak through me, to speak to each of our hearts, Lord God, of what you have to say to us today. Give us each a rhema word, Lord. Make particular words come alive to us, Lord. Just, just land on particular words for us, Lord, just because you love us so much. Because you love us so much, Father, I trust that you will do that, that you will speak directly to each of us today. Lord, by your Spirit, because you are amazing and because you do things like that. Because you just land on us, Lord, and you speak and you want to instruct and you want to lead and you want us to follow you. Lord God, we just embrace you. We embrace you, Lord, and present all of our members to you right now. Just, just do that with me. It's in Romans, I think, chapter 6 where he says to present your members to him, consecrate yourself to him. Lord, I present the ears of my spirit and my natural ears to you. I give them to you, Lord. I present them to you. And I present my eyes, Lord, the eyes of my spirit, well, as well as the natural eyes that I have. I present them to you, Lord. And I say, I will be focused in the natural and in the spirit. I will see what you desire for me to see. And I will hear what you desire for me to hear. Lord, I present my body and my soul, my emotions and my, my thoughts, my imaginations. I present them to you, Lord. I offer them to you, God, as an offering, as a sweet-smelling sacrifice, Lord, to you. I give myself to you, Papa, and I ask, Lord, that you would do with me today what you will. Lord, that you would do with me today what you will, what you desire, what your heart's desire is, Lord. Speak it into my heart, Lord, and I will follow you, and I will obey you, God, and I will pursue you, Father, in every area you want me to pursue you in. And then you will open up the windows of heaven. You will open up the realm of the Spirit to me because I faithfully pursued you, because I faithfully stepped towards you, Lord, and said, yes, yes, God, yes, yes, I want you, yes. God. <laughs> I want you, Papa. Yes. I want you, Daddy. <laughs> just because I said yes, God, just because I said yes. The Spirit and the Bride, they say, come. And we respond by saying, we will come, God. We will come. We will come to you, Lord. We will run to you. We will progress towards you, towards your heart, Lord, towards what you have for each of us, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for the journey that you have each of us on that's individual and specific, Lord, that you are teaching each of us the things we need to learn from your heart, God. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, that your hand is upon each of these here and each person even listening on YouTube, God, that your hand is on us and you are guiding us, guiding our hearts, turning our hearts like the, you turn the rivers of water, like the heart of a king, God. You, you have your hand on our hearts and you're turning us in the directions you want us to go in. Thank you, God. And we just declare we will flow with your spirit, Lord. We will flow with your heart. We will move with you, God. Wherever you say to move, we will move. If you say to step to the left, we'll step to the left, God. If you yes. say get in our car and go to this place, we'll get in our car and go to this place. If you yes. say sit in my presence and just soak in of me, God, then that's what we'll do. We'll just take you. And if you just say close your mouth and just listen to me for an hour, that's what we'll do, Papa. Because our hearts are given over to you, God. Because we just love you so much. Because you are everything, Daddy. You are everything. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the mighty God. You are the everlasting Father. <laughs> we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Well, we've been talking about activating and aligning our spiritual senses to the Lord and hindrances. Um, I'm going to finish hindrances today, and then I want to get into hunger and thirst, because that's what the Lord's laid on my heart, and we need to hunger and thirst, and that's a huge key. It's not a hindrance. 
It's a big wide door that opens up to the Spirit of God when we hunger and we thirst after him. So we talked about in 2 Kings 6 about Elisha and his servant Gehazi, who, you know, Elisha could see in the Spirit, but Gehazi couldn't. So there are times in our lives when we can see in the Spirit and when we can't. And, and sometimes if somebody will pray for us, then the, it'll open up. Or if God just sovereignly comes on us, or we start hungering to see, and we start praying that Ephesians 3 or 1 prayer, one, um, that he would open the eyes of our heart, that we would be enlightened, that we would know what is the hope of his calling, then he'll do it. Because <laughs> he just says, ask and seek and knock, and he'll open the door. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and he'll open the door. It's all he wants. I mean, it's just so simple. He makes it so simple, and we can make it so hard and complicated. But there are things that we can do and things that we can believe that can hinder God and hinder us from aligning ourselves with God and opening up our senses to him. Lacking in intimacy, not having a place to go and spend time with him, not spending that time with him. Maybe you have a place, but you're busy and you didn't spend time with him. That will hinder. So obviously the opposite is true. Intimacy with God will open your spiritual senses. Intimacy with God will tune you into what he's saying to you and lead you into your destiny. I mean, what is your destiny? What is your calling? Every single person has a destiny and a calling. Every single one of us has something that God has for us to do. But first he wants us to be before we go and do. And, and I've always, my whole life had it, my whole Christian life had it backwards. I've always wanted to do and I really didn't know about the being. I didn't, I didn't know. Why didn't I know? I don't know. It wasn't majored on. It wasn't taught like consistently when I was first born again. I didn't hear it consistently. I need to be. I need to be in his presence. I need to find out who I am, what my identity is. I need to find out who he is and just be a lover of God. And as I'm a lover of God, he takes me into the doing. And then the doing is empowered and it's not exhausting. It's invigorating because he's in the middle of it, in the doing. So first I need to be. First I need to exist in his presence. First I need to pursue his face, which is his presence, intimacy. You know, if, if a person's face is removed, it's like the person, you know, there's no, you can't have intimacy with that person. You can't see who they are. You could cut off an arm and that person's still that person, right? You can lose another arm, you can lose your legs, that person's still a person, but when their face if something happens to their face, it's like their identity is missing. Obviously, we know it's not. They're still Susie Q, whoever they were before. But you know what I'm saying? Your face is really important. God's face is what he wants us to seek. Seek my face. My heart said, your face, Lord, I will seek. That's intimacy. That's who he is. That's that. I mean, you could have identical, look identical from behind, but two, those two people turn around and they have different faces and you like, realize, oh, okay, that's not who I thought it was. That is. And because their faces are different. You could have the same hair, the same shape, the same clothing, but if your faces are different, God's face is what he wants us to seek. The, in, the uniqueness of who he is. The uniqueness of who he is, of his personality, of, of the fact that he is a loving daddy, that how much he loves you. And that's so surfacey. He wants to take you deep into his love. And oh, that's another topic. <laughs> so we'll move on. Be intimate, number one. Um, if you have a sinful, unbelieving heart, not believing that this inheritance is for you, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, well, start believing that it is. There's an inheritance <laughs> that he has created just for you. There's inheritance. There are things he wants you to walk in. There's revelation and understanding he wants to give you. There are gifts he wants to give you. And there's an inheritance that is for you. It's got your name on it. It's all tied up with ribbons and bows and it's wrapped up. And he's like, come on, come and get it. But you have to believe. You can't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. And that's Hebrews 3, 12 and 19. It talks about like having an unbelieving heart. The Israelites had an unbelieving heart. And they turned away from the living God. Um, the third one was you can't have, don't have a hardened heart because of sin. And it says in Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily so none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another daily. There's something in that believers exhorting each other daily. 
daily, it says. Exhort one another daily. Encourage each other. Talk about the Lord. Talk about what he's teaching you, and it will stir it up in your life. Exhort each other daily. Then you won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Mm -hmm. When you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews, it says that three or four times. It's quoted from the Old Testament. When you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The first time I started studying this recently, a couple months ago, I'm looking at thing, that thinking, how could anybody harden their heart when they hear the voice of God? And he's shown me that I did it over the years. You know, when he would say, you'd be wooing me, come and spend time with me, come and read my word, come, come away and just be with me. And I'd be like, no, that sounds boring. I think I'll do this. You know, I didn't say that, but that was really my thought process. No, I think I'll wash the dishes. That sounds hard. That sounds like work. I don't even know how to do that. Like, how do I do that? I don't, I don't know how to do that. When he speaks to us, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. How did the Israelites harden their hearts? They disobeyed God. They grumbled and they complained. They, um, they, were, they were disbelieving. They didn't believe him. He would provide for them. He said, for 40 years, I showed them my miracles. I showed them my signs and wonders for 40 years. And they just complained and complained and complained instead of being thankful and, and realizing, whoa, look at these miracles. That's the God of heaven. He's amazing. And worshiping him, instead, they got caught up in life and were like, I'm tired of this manna. I want cucumbers and leeks. And I want to go back to Egypt and be in slavery again. It was better back there. I mean, they said that. They said that. We say that too. We can say that too. I want to go back. This is hard. I, I don't want to live by faith. I, I want to go back and, you know, do whatever I have to do to get whatever I need to get, to feed my flesh, whatever my flesh wants. I want to go after that. I want to sit and watch a movie, and I want to fill myself with this movie producer in Hollywood with his thoughts instead of God's thoughts because that's what my flesh wants. That's going back into bondage. And you can watch movies. So God gives you a conviction that this is a waste of time. You can watch movies. It's okay. I was watching one the other day. With my kids had it on, and it was, um, uh, I don't remember what, what it was called. But anyways, this girl kept saying she was in this fake world, like this world where they induced a, with a drug. And she was in this world. She had to fight, and she had to escape from it. And she kept stopping and saying, this isn't real. This isn't real. And she'd come right out of the dream or whatever. And I realized, this isn't real. Why am I watching this? This is stupid. I'm wasting my time. It was called Divergent. It's a good movie. Oh, okay. But um, it was waste. For me, it's been a conviction in my life. This is a waste of time. I do not want to watch TV or watch movies or do anything but be with Jesus because I just want to be filled up with him. And, and when I go into those other things, I'm wasting. I've already wasted years of my life not pursuing his presence and, and going after religion and doing Good works in the kingdom. I've already wasted too much time. And in the midst of the wasting, I learned good lessons, and it was okay. But I'm moving forward from here, and that's just a conviction that I personally have. Okay, um, don't have a hardened heart because of sin. In Hebrews 3.13, we talked about that. Um, activated senses are pliable and soft, and God can easily connect with activated senses. And all you have to do is say, God, I'm pliable and I'm soft before you. And I want you to move in my midst and move in my being and speak to me and open my eyes. And that, that right there, that's a pliable, soft attitude. And he can work with that. You know, it's about our attitude. It's about what we believe. It's about what we envision in our hearts and, and seeing, seeing him, seeing him fall upon you will cause him to fall upon you. Because that's, it's just faith. It's believing. You know, Jesus saw, he said, I don't do anything unless the Father first shows me, unless I see the Father do it, unless I hear the Father do it. Well, that means the Lord was showing him things. He was seeing things inside. And when he saw them, then he reached out and he did them. This morning, was, the Lord was showing me, oh, Christ in me is the expectation of glory. He's in me. And I was envisioning him in, in me, like toes to head and fingertips. And then Christ is in God and I am in Christ, and Christ is in God, and God is in me, that means God is all over me, too. So, you know, Mike's song before about put, he put me on like a glove, you know? Like, he's all over me, and he's all inside of me. I'm sandwiched between, 
the Holy Spirit inside of me and God the Father on the outside of me, and we're just we're just surrounded by God. I mean, it, it was a, it was just it was an amazing moment of <gasps> whoa! But that was my imagination that's sanctified, given over to God. My imagination is sanctified, so He can use it. He can He can speak to me through my mind because it's sanctified. Because I'm not putting any junk into it. Maybe. Here and there's some negativity that, that I hear from the people around me, you know, but I instantly go, no, I'm not going to receive that, you know. Okay, there are world events that are catastrophic. Well, I'll just pray about those world events and not receive the worry of them, you know, that concern, that, oh my goodness, we need to get upset about what's happening in the world. What good does it do? It does no good. It does no good. So, yeah. Resting in God, resting in the goodness of God, resting in who he is, and just not even taking in the negative, not receiving it. Um, the fourth reason that we hinder our alignment with God is a lack of faith. Um, in Hebrews 3.14 it says, We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction or hope firmly to the end. Hope is expectation. Bible hope isn't just hoping. Biblical hope is expectation. It's pistis in the Greek. It's faith. Pistis. It's faith. It's an inwrought persuasion, an expectation. Jesus expected God to do things. The disciples, he, he said, you know, I give you authority to do all these things. Now go. They expected God to do something. They had faith. They believed. They expected. So, a lack of faith will hinder us aligning with God. Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and believe that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. There are certain things we have to believe about God. Certain, certain things we have to expect. That if I have faith, he's going to reward me by giving me what I'm trusting him for. And if I earnestly seek him, then he'll reward me for earnestly seeking him. What will he reward me with? Himself. <laughs> As I earnestly seek him, I will find him. And he is amazing. He's, he's just been showing me aspects of his personality. And um, I, he's just amazing. Ask him. Ask him to show you aspects of his personality. Who are you, Father? Because he's like so many things. And then like you get on the internet and look at lists of aspects of his personality. And they're just words. Mm -hmm. But when you experience his personality, when you experience who he is, when he opens up his word to you and all of a sudden it's like, oh, Jesus is my brother and you're my father. And whoa, I'm in the family. I'm in the family, and you're not ashamed. You're not ashamed to adopt me in and call me your daughter, to call me your sister. That's incredible. I've read that so many times, but he's opened my eyes to it. Like, I'm in the family. I'm in the family, and he's in me, and he's all around me, and it's good. Proverbs 8, 17. I love this scripture. It says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. I love those who love me. And it reminds me of a prophetic word I recently was given that, that said, I love the way you love me. That's what the Father said. I love the way you love me. I, isn't that awesome? This scripture is talking about wisdom. It's wisdom speaking. Well, Jesus Christ was made unto us to be wisdom from God, right? And righteousness and sanctification. So he is wisdom. And he says, I love those who love me. I love those who love me. Like he's passionately in love with you when you are in love with him. I love those who love me. And those who seek me diligently will find me. Will find me. In Hebrews 10.38 it says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But let's look at the opposite of that. The just shall live by faith, and if any man pursues me and keeps on pressing and diligently seeking me, my soul has so much pleasure in that person. <laughs> God has pleasure. He takes pleasure in you. He takes pleasure in you as you diligently seek him, 
As you don't draw back and say, oh, I can't do this, or let your flesh rule, but you say, no, my flesh was crucified with Christ. It no longer lives. Now I am living in him. I'm alive in him. He has made me alive. Then my flesh, then I won't be drawing back. I'll be pushing forward into him, and he will take great pleasure in me. He will have pleasure. Could somebody deal with that banging glue? You just go over and yell at somebody over there. <laughs> Knock them around. <laughs> uh, so he takes pleasure in me when I pursue him. I mean, just picture that. You pursuing the Father. You in your secret place. Wherever it is you go to spend time with Jesus that you have set aside, and that's your sanctuary, your little place. He is actually, he's just, he's just there, and he's taking in you, and he is delighting in you. He loves when you pursue him. It lights him up. It gets him all excited and happy. It's like the best thing in the world for him. It's Christmas Day when Natalie says, Father, I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. I'm here. Here I am, Lord. And you might be sitting there thinking, where are you, God? And he's like, yes! You know, she's here! He's here! He's spending time with me. He's pursuing me. That is the heart of the Father towards you. Absolutely gushing and overwhelmed and overflowing that you would love him. That you would take pleasure in him. Anything we feel about God, you know, that's good. Like, oh, I'm so excited. Or I just saw his majesty today. He feels the same thing about us. Wow, look at her. <laughs> look at him. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they're pursuing me. Look at the heart that's turned towards me. I mean, it's amazing people in the Bible who did things that were fantastic, they just pursued God. They just got hungry for God. They just went after him. That's all, you know? They went after them, him with their whole hearts. And they just left themselves behind and went after him. <sighs> okay, so disobedience is another thing that will prevent us from aligning with God. Hebrews 3.18, the Israelites disobeyed, and it caused them to not enter his rest which is a place of living, it's, a, it's the abiding, it's John 15. Resting in God is abiding in him. Resting in him is knowing all of his character traits, like how good he is and how awesome, how amazing and how kind and how loving and how generous and how abundant he is and just resting in what we know about him. Resting our lives, it's, it's defined as, as the word repose. It's like sitting back and just being in God. It's physical, it's mental, it's soulish, and it's spiritual. It's a spiritual rest, but it affects, it, it's like, I'm, I'm going to stop trying to strive and work, and I'm just going to be. I'm just going to be in your presence. And that's something the Lord's been teaching me about is rest, and that's a whole thing weeks long in itself, but it's a good topic. <clears throat> um, another hindrance is not practicing his uh, being aware of his spirit. And we taught a couple weeks on this. Hebrews 5.14, by reason of use, you have your senses exercised to discern good from evil. Okay, so I want to get into hunger and thirst now. So we talked about some things that would prevent us from aligning with God. This is something that will align you with God. It won't prevent you. It will get you zoom, moving forward in the things of God. Hungering and thirsting. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is talking about um, the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about lots of good things. Blessing, being blessed. And he says in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. In the New Living it says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. They will be satisfied. In the Greek, I looked up the word blessed. It means to become large. Become large. So you'll be blessed if you hunger and thirst after his righteousness, after him. You'll be blessed. You'll become large. It's when God extends his benefits to you. Blessed. Um, it's a believer being in an enviable position from receiving God's provisions and favor. To be blessed means he pours. He pours stuff out on you. He pours himself. He pours blessings. He pours things. He pours his spirit. He pours 
you know, the awareness of who he is. He, he, when you're blessed, you're large, you're living large. You're full of who God is. You're filled with good things. Material things, yes, but better than that, spiritual things. Better than material things. I remember a time in my life when I didn't understand that spiritual things were better than material things. And someone would say that, and it was like, ugh, I couldn't relate to it. Oh my goodness. Spiritual things are so much better because there's the life of God wrapped up in spiritual things. Material things are just things. They'll burn, you know? They're... They're, they're food for a fire, but spiritual things will live forever, and they have the life of God inside of them. It's, they're like electrified with the life of God. So when you learn a spiritual truth, when he shows you an aspect of who he is, a, um, a facet, like a diamond has facets, you know, all the little shiny spots on it are facets. When he shows you a facet of who he is in your life, that is full of electricity. It's full of the life of God. It's filled with Him. And it electrifies you. It lights you up. It makes you live larger because you're blessed. Um, blessing. This happens with receiving or obeying the Lord's inbirthings of faith. So when, you tell, when, he, when He puts faith inside of you and you act on that faith, you get blessed. That's, that's, that's just the word blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. To hunger means to crave ardently, to seek with eager desire. So I've had times where I would go into God's presence just because I knew I needed to, and nothing, it's like nothing was happening. He wasn't speaking to me, or I wasn't tuning in, I couldn't hear, I wasn't experiencing anything, I, wasn't, I didn't feel like I was moving forward. But when you stop when that's happening, when you stop and you say, okay, Lord, I'm hungry for you. I am craving ardently for you. I want you to show up. I want you to show up, God. That's exercising that faith and the blessing of hunger will fall upon you and you'll be filled with that righteousness. It's, it's like in our words, our words are key. Saying, God, I want this. I want, I want to know you in this way. It's like it releases him to just fall all over you. So to hunger means to crave ardently, to seek with eager desire. Are you seeking him with eager desire? Are you doing whatever he says? It'll be a passing thought that'll just fly through your head. Oh, I should pray in tongues. Well, don't ignore that. Do it. Pray in tongues. Oh, I should worship him. Like, worship me. It just flies through you. Worship me. And then, you know, we just like... We're thinking about other things, so we just totally miss that. Or we stop and say, oh, the words worship me just came through my head. I need to worship him. And that will cause him like, to show up, you know, to be there. I mean, he's in us, but he wants to manifest himself to us. Moses was on the mount, mountain. He was walked up there. There's a burning bush. God manifested himself to Moses. He showed up in the cloud and the fire, you know, Water out of a rock. Manna from heaven. God wants to manifest himself to us. And there's nothing wrong with going after that. And if you're going after the spirit of God, if you're going after the Holy Spirit, if you're going after Jesus, something else is not going to manifest. And if it does, let's just say it does, because I've heard, I've heard people teach that. Oh, an angel showed up, and what they said was they could feel like there was a sense of evil. There was a sense of foreboding. There was a sense of like not a godly fear. It was a scary fear, a frightening fear. So they knew, obviously, this is Satan coming as an angel of light. Go. And it goes, you know. <laughs> Leave me. You, you ha we have to be very sensitive and in tune with what's going on. What are we feeling? What are we sensing? But God wants us to pursue him. Moses pitched a tent outside the camp. And he went in there, and he spent time with God. And God showed up, and the people were all like at their tent doors, <gasps> worshiping God. There was, something was happening there. They stood there, and they watched it, and they worshiped it from their tent doors way back here. And then it says Joshua, the son of Nun, was in there with them. You know, and when Moses was done, Joshua stayed. There was something there. There wasn't nothing. There was something. <laughs> there was something going on. God was showing up. God was talking. God was visiting them. Whatever it was, it was good. And they knew it was good. Because they didn't, like, they weren't bored. Have you ever, have you ever gone to spend time with God and it's like you're bored? I've been there. 
It's like nothing's happening. Well, that's when you have to do something different. If you're just sitting there and let's say a half hour goes by and you're just staying silent and you're just, you're just listening and nothing is happening, ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? What, what should I do to get myself in, a, in position, to align myself with you? Not that we have to work for the presence of God, but if he's wanting worship, well, he wants to tell you that, but we have to ask. So he'll want you to do something different. That's how what I've experienced. And then he shows up and it's like, ah, oh, yay. Okay, to thirst. <clears throat> Those who are said to thirst, who painfully feel their want of and eagerly long for those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. Those are said to thirst, those people are said to thirst, who painfully feel their want of the refreshing of their soul, who painfully feel their want of and eagerly long for things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. To thirst means that you know you need God. <laughs> You eagerly long for God. And if you're not feeling it, then just say it by faith. Lord, I'm, I long. I'm longing for your presence. I'm thirsty for you, God. I want you, Lord. I am painfully feeling my want and eagerly longing for you. And as you say that, you know, whatever we say comes to pass. We speak words. Words have power in them. The Lord says in Isaiah 55 that I, I, you know, rain down from heaven, rain and snow, and I water the earth, and I bring forth things forth, and they grow, and what he says comes to pass. I mean, it was in this other translation, New Living. I'm going to just read this to you because, you see, this is talking about God and his words, but when I speak his words out my mouth, it's the same as when God spoke. He, you know, Speak to the mountain, Jesus said. Speak to the mountain and it'll move. You speak. You speak. Don't just have him speak. You speak. Isaiah 55 to 11. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. I love that. It always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. It's the same with my word. It always produces fruit. So if you're speaking God's word saying, Lord, you said I'd be blessed if I hunger and thirst after you. So I'm hungry. I declare right now for myself, I am hungry. I am thirsty for more of you, for your righteousness. Then it'll happen. You'll begin to get hungry. Now in the kingdom, in the natural, we go without food and we get hungry. In the kingdom, we feed ourselves more and we get hungry. It's opposite. The more we feed on God, the hungrier we get. That's a Rachel Latifu quote. <laughs> By the way, we were talking about that a long time ago, and she said that. The more we feed on God, the hungrier we get for him. So we put more of him in us. We study more. We read more. He leads us to a certain topic. Like you just have a leading, or this happens to me a lot. I'll just feel like I need to turn on my computer and go to YouTube and watch a certain preacher. Maybe even like just a name flashes through my, my spirit and I just tune in and it's exactly what God has been speaking to me. Whatever they're talking about is exactly what he's been speaking to me. And that happens all the time just because I'm tuning in. I'm always asking him, what do you want to say to me today, Lord? <laughs> what do you want to do today? Where do you want to go? What, what, what do you want to teach me? And he does. I mean, he just does, and I'm not special. I'm not any better than you. He'll do that for you too, but it's just a matter of getting hungry, saying, God, I want to be hungry. I want to be thirsty for righteousness. Righteousness is divine approval. It's what God approves of. It's his, his form of rightness. What we might think is righteousness, like let's say we look at a certain person's life, and we think, oh, they're living unrighteously. Well, he might think differently. Because he knows what he's doing in that person, you know? And so we can't always be like the judge and jury of righteousness in everybody's lives. We just have to like live our own lives and get our own lives straight, you know, get us straight and let him deal with other people. It's divine approval. It's what God deems right after his examination, what is approved of in his eyes. It's him making everything right, making it straight, making crooked places straight. 
That is righteousness. And then I've heard other, you know, Kenyans' uh, definition is the ability to stand in the presence of God without, oh gosh, it's been 20 years, without fear or inferiority or something like that. I don't know if you, any of you have read Kenyan. Um, something like that. The ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of inferiority or shame or something. There's a lot of definitions, but when I looked it up in the Greek, this is what it said, divine approval. And this is, this is what it is, what he deems right. So I'm hungry and I'm thirsty, Lord, for what you say is right, for whatever you approve of. What is he? He approves of me going after him wholeheartedly. He approves of me pursuing him, pursuing him, going over the edge with him, jumping off the cliff, climbing to the top of the mountain, and just free-falling with him. He approves of me going after everything in life that, that I can possibly go after that he pulls me towards. He approves of that. So I'm hungry and I'm thirsty for righteousness. I mean, he is righteousness. He is justice. I'm hungry and thirsty for you, Lord. I want more of you. I want to, I've got all of him, but yet it, the Bible also tells about a fullness, a fullness, like he's filling us with all the fullness of God, but there's more fullness. There's, it's like he fills you and then he packs it down and he makes room and he fills you with more. And then he packs it down and he makes more room and he fills you with more. It's like when he fills us with things, it's not in the natural, like a cup that gets filled up. When he fills us, he creates more space. He creates more space so that he can fill us with himself even more. He's just so different than what we think he is. <laughs> he, he has abundant resources. He doesn't lack. Sometimes in my prayer life, I've gotten this sense of, well, I can't ask for that because like, almost like he's lacking. No, God has abundant resources. He has, he has everything. Everything under the sun belongs to him. Abundant resources. He has enough grace. You know, the, the, whoever it was in the Old Testament shouted grace, grace to the mountain. Mm -hmm. I don't remember who it was. I just read it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, they shouted grace to the mountain. He has so much grace. It's power. Shouting power to the mountain. It's shouting the power of God. That God's coming in into this place and into this situation and he's going to fix it. He's not lacking. His arm isn't short he can reach out and he can do whatever needs to be done. There is no lack in heaven. There is, he has abundant love, abundant power to hand out to each and every one of us, and it didn't deplete his bucket by one drop. It's never-ending. And on earth, you know, we dump a bucket out, it's empty. Well, in the heavenlies, you dump a bucket out and it's still full. <laughs> it's different than on earth, you know? Um, Jesus' prayer, that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. He has an abundant supply of love. He has an abundant supply of healing. He has an abundant supply of mercy. He has an abundant supply of, of everything we need from him, <clears throat> of time. He will give you his time every moment of the day. He will be with you just at the same time that he'll be with Megan. He'll be with all of us, speaking to us, all at the same time. It's like, okay, this is like, a, a, you know, we know this, but do you know that? Do you believe that? Do you walk like that? Do you live it out? That he is always with me. He's always empowering me. His grace is always there. His grace is leaning over you to bless you because he just wants to pour himself out upon you. It's, it's car caris, grace. He's just leaning over you just Blessing you, like overshadowing you, overshadowing you. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, after his approval, what he sees as right. For they will be filled, filled. They will be gorged, to gorge. <laughs> Supply food in abundance, to feed, fill, and satisfy. If you hunger and thirst after him and his ways, he will fill you till you feel gorged. You're so full, all that can come out is like shouts of thanksgiving. All that can come out is tears and this overwhelming sense of, oh my God, you are so big. You are so big. <laughs> you are so amazing. You are so full. And he's like, you know, never ending love, never ending um, compassion, and never ending like tender mercies, you know, his loving kindness mercies. They never end. They never end. And he just fills and 
gorgeous us. Okay. Okay, it's 10, 9.44, so we have to stop. Whew, hungry. We're hungry, Lord. Yes. Make us hungry, Papa.